Thanks for tuning in to Written on the Edge, Season 7, Episode 32. I'm Van Sebastian, and I'm really glad you're here with me. On today's show, John Whittier Treat joins us to discuss his latest novel, First Consonants, followed by my review of dun, 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 Big Eden, which I hadn't seen until this week. And then we'll share what's held our attention this week. So if you like hearing updates from queer content creators, support us on Patreon, hit our merchandise, but now on to our guest. John Whittier Treat is the winner of the Christopher Hewitt Award in Fiction and a Pushcart Prize nominee. He's the author of the novel The Rise and Fall of the Yellow House by Big Table Publishing, a finalist for the 2016 Lambda Literary Foundation Award for Best Gay Fiction. He was also a finalist for both the Fiction and Poetry Prizes in the 2021 Saints and Sinners competition. His opinion pieces have appeared in the New York Times, HuffPost, and Out Magazine. He's lived in the Pacific Northwest for four decades and currently resides in Seattle with his husband. John, welcome to the show. Thank you, Vance. So where did the fire start? Why why be creative? Why write? Hmm. Well, I guess even as a as a little kid, um, I think I perceived the world as a collection of stories, um, serially organized, overlapping. Uh, and so I was drawn to reading stories. Uh, I eventually had a career, a long career, teaching literature. Um, and then as I got on in years, I decided that I had some stories I wanted to tell. Um, so I began to write late in life, but um, I'm still at it. Awesome. And we're here today to talk about your novel, First Consonants. What can you tell me about it? <clears throat> well, uh, it's not autobiographical, but it's about stutterers. And I am a stutterer. Um, I wanted to write about how uh, the world appears to a stutterer because we have a long tradition of the non-stuttering world looking at stutterers. Uh, we're often seen as um, fools or uh, idiots or um, morally defective in some way. And I wanted to write another kind of story. I wanted to write uh, about a stutterer who has a chance to save the world and uh, may actually do so. That's awesome. So who's the main character? What's the plot? What should people know? Uh, my main character's name, Brian. Uh, I have him born shortly after Second World War, so he's somewhat younger than I am. Excuse me, old, older than I am. <laughs> That's right. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Uh, and he has a normal childhood in suburbia, except for the fact that he stutters. And there are some experiences he has being bu bu bullied or, or uh, embarrassed, um, ridiculed, even by his own parents, that mm -hmm. uh, make him extremely angry at, at the outside world. And like many stutterers, he can't fight back with words. He doesn't trust words. Uh, words betray him. So he acts out in violent ways. Um, and so the novel is about violence as well as stuttering, particularly male violence. Um, and there are some tragic consequences uh, to his violence that result, for instance, in the breakup of his marriage. Um, he eventually decides he wants to get away from it all. He wants to be in a very quiet place, and he can't think of any place more quiet, less demanding of, 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 of speech than the Alaskan Act and escape his problems in dealing with the outside world. And like many people who... Uh, moved to Alaska, he finds out that he's brought his problems with, with him. Mm. And so the climax of the novel um, occurs uh, when he's living uh, alone with the company of a dog in a cabin in uh, rural Alaska. I won't give away the ending, but uh, there's a reason why there's uh, a forest fire on the cover of the book. I was going to ask what what the world was happening with that he needed to save us from, but I think you just spilled it. So you mentioned a little bit about 
um, how stutterers see the world and that words betray them. Uh, is there more that people should know, especially people who've never been around it? Uh, I think if you're not a stutterer, you may not realize how central a speech is to everything. And particularly, I think, in the Western world where um, uh, from, from, from the Hebrew Bible on, uh, speech is given a central position, uh, not only in human society, but in our spirituality and our ability to be saved. Um, you know, uh, off, quite often um, ancient prophets, uh, including in the Hebrew tra tradition, uh, had some kind of handicap. They were blind, mm -hmm. um, for instance, or they were lame. But uh, Moses had trouble talking. Uh, his brother Aaron, had to speak for him in 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 the Old Testament, but something happened um, later on. Uh, stutterers uh, become uh, tragic. Uh, I think the classic example of that, for those of us who read English literature, must be Melville's Billy Budd where the handsome sailor Billy is unable to save himself because he stutters and is unable to answer uh, the captain's question that might have saved his life. And that's very much the tradition uh, I grew up in. I grew up with Porky the Pig cartoons, uh, where a stuttering uh, pig is hilarious. Um, and I think that uh, I'd like the non-stirring world just to be patient with us. Um, it's a misconception that if you try hard enough, you can overcome your stutter. Um, sometimes you simply can't. Mm -hmm. And I think a lot of people who stutter nowadays just say, well, I'm going to stutter and get over it. Um, it's not our problem. It's a disability it's a handicap but uh we learn to live with it i used to work with the deaf community quite a bit and they had mm -hmm. a similar mentality in that right. this is who i am this is not my problem this is your problem be patient with me and we will communicate so yes but there was, i have a deaf friend who who go ahead oh, i was just saying and there was a lot of rage rage and anger just because the yeah. hearing world wasn't patient yeah, no. It's effortless for um, so-called normal people uh, to speak, to hear. Um, and stutterers live, even when we're not stuttering, we live in constant fear of stuttering. We're often thinking several words ahead of our mouths, thinking that's going to be a hard word for me. I'm, not, I'm going to stutter on that word. I have to find a substitute, some word I won't stutter on. Um, and sometimes we do and sometimes we don't. Mm -hmm. That's fair. How does Brian overcome it? I mean, aside from moving to Alaska. He doesn't really. Um, his brother, who's a... a important character in the book uh, outgrows stuttering in his youth. And, and that's common. And my own brother outgrew his stutter, but he finds it coming back in his 30s, um, which can happen. Brian uh, had expected as he got older uh, for that particular problem in his life to recede or actually become less important, mm -hmm. but his stutter becomes worse. And he doesn't know why. Um, a stutterer is inclined to think that um, if not if something isn't wrong with him, then, then he or she has done something wrong. So his worsening stutter uh, inspires a kind of critical self-inspection, self-reflection, which yields some answers, but more often than not, he simply comes up against a roadblock. 
And in Alaska, uh, he doesn't have people nearby that he can take his frustrations out on. So he has to find new outlets to do so. And uh, that's the climax of, of the story. Right. Is there anything else you want folks to know about the book before I move on to your next one? Well, it's about stuttering. It's about uh, male violence. It's about aging. But also when I was writing it, I came to the conclusion that uh, even if the environment isn't the principal theme of what we write, it's our responsibility nowadays to have it somewhere in our story. Mm -hmm. And that's part of the reason I move the venue of Brian's story to rural Alaska, where I've spent a lot of time. And uh, I and many other people are concerned about what uh, lies around the corner for Alaska. The Tongass National Forest, uh, which is the largest um, national forest in America, uh, has never had a forest fire. It's been too cool and too wet. And as a result, uh, hundreds, thousands of years of organic material have accumulated on the forest floor. But Alaska is getting warmer and drier. Um, if you live there, uh, you recognize that. And someday that forest is going to ignite. Mm -hmm. And uh, I write about that in the novel as well. Um, and I link it up to the life that Brian is leading in the last years of his life. Gotcha. So what's up next? And I know you teased in email that you've got an upcoming novel. Yeah, I'm halfway through a first draft of a new novel, tentatively called um, The Sixth City of Refuge. Um, and... Uh, I guess my ambition is to be a writer of the Pacific Northwest, and I've, I've placed previous works in Seattle, Seattle suburbs, Alaska. And in this, I take two young men, uh, gay men in a relationship, who leave L.A. and uh, the A-list lifestyle to live in a small rural town in eastern Washington state. Mm. And... Um, they're struggling with several personal issues, uh, which they think are unique to them. And they encounter in this small town, they move to a subculture, an underground of survivalists or, or what are popularly called preppers. Mm -hmm. And they become involved with some of these survivalists and they find that some of their concerns are shared with these people. And uh, all of them find that they have to, they have to uh, explore solutions to uh, problems that are partially unique, but uh, partially they have in common. So uh, it's, a, it's a new kind of work for me, uh, but, um, I'm having a great deal of, I won't say fun, uh, I'm learning a great deal from spending time in rural Washington State, getting to know people who are in the survivalist movement. Uh, I'm excited about this. Wow. That sounds intense. And what a beautiful area. I had family in Spokane for a while, so I've actually mm -hmm. seen that side of the mountains, and it's beautiful. Right, right. Well, the town I'm uh, putting uh, my two uh, young men in is Ellensburg, mm. which, as you know, is halfway between um, Seattle and Spokane. Yep. Um, and uh, I'm writing sympathetically about rural Washington in the same way I've written sympathetically about stutterers in my present book. I think they've gotten a bad rap. Mm -hmm. Yeah. All right. As well, if I promise not to hold you to this, do you have an expected publication date? I have an expected uh, finish, my favorite word, 
nice. uh, finish date for the first draft, after which point I will uh, begin to look for a publisher, and that will be the middle of uh, 2023. Nice. All right. Well, do you have a social media site that you like to use where people can follow updates on this project? Hmm. I have a website. Perfect. Uh, I don't post to it frequently, but maybe I should. It's uh, www.johnwhittiertreat, one word, um, dot com. Awesome. And do you have any final words of wisdom for folks? One day at a time. Perfect. All right. I'd like to extend a huge thank you to John Whittier Treat for being with me today. John, thank you so much. Thank you, Vince. And we at Written on the Edge are proud to introduce you to new media by queer content creators. So if you enjoy learning about new artists, please like and subscribe so you get the alerts for new episodes. Now, on to the review. gals guys and days we're back with our review and this time we are reviewing and it's kind of a trailer from last episode where i really didn't like the lake and i cited a couple of things and i thought vance had seen both of them i cited uh well actually you saw schitt's creek and you've seen um uh northern exposure so you knew of those have I've you never seen it I've never seen Northern Exposure. Oh, my God. Now we got to do that one, too. Okay. Well, anyways, I also mentioned Big Eden. So that's what we are doing this week. And just a little rundown uh, on it. It's Big Eden is a small fictional northwestern Montana town. And it's a homecoming story of sorts with a very long unrequited romance that has gone on for years, unbeknownst to our protagonist who is caught up with something else from his past. Kind of there are two unrequited romances. Yeah. Yeah. But anyways, uh, I am very, very curious. Most, most of the children say anxious, but anxious is not the word. Um, I am very, very curious on what you thought. Is that right? It's a cute little love, love, love story. Um, for those out there, Arya Gross plays the main character who has gone home to take care of his father after some health issues. And, uh, and so his character's name is Henry, uh, Henry's best friend from back in the day, played by Tim Decay, one of my favorite actors, uh, character's name is Dean Stewart is also home, has been the straight friend who's been out of touch and they try to rekindle the friendship but from Henry's side, it is, of course, I love a straight boy. Yes. And it's, it's, a lo- it's kind of a situation of one pair of eyes is looking one way, mm-hmm. another pair of eyes is looking to the first one, and the third one hasn't figured out his shit yet. And so right. we've got this kind of long, kind of, both in time and in person to person to person kind of situ- situation. Right. Um, so the this, third person in this mix is, is Pike, played by Eric Schweig. Schweig. Mm-hmm. Um, and Pike actor, like, been in many, many things. Mm-hmm. And he was really good. And so Pike likes Henry. Henry likes Dean. Dean likes women. So it's not really a triangle. No. It's a, it's a weird bucket of crazy romance. So, so Dean does really he love Henry, but yes, just as not the brother. way Henry has always been waiting for. Yeah. Right. Um, I think the charming and most amazing part of this story, though, is the fact that the entire town, old and young, has zero problem with the fact that one boy loves another. And as a matter of fact, try to get some of these guys together. Right. right. The whole cooking sequence is one of the best in the movie. <laughs> 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 running, with the, running with the chickens. <laughs> Anyways, yep. uh, I, this is why I cited this as my juxtaposition to the lake because here you have just as many quirky characters i mean you have widow thayer who oh is God. trying to put her, her, him together with all the women in the, henry with all the women in town who are single and then she figures it out and then she tries to hook him up with all the men nearby who well, are she single. doesn't figure it out she's told by the other women well, okay <laughs> fair enough you know. she, she still switches gears and tries just as hard goes right back into the fray <laughs> Oh, well, you've met. 
well, this isn't about that. <laughs> well, and then the party she hosts. Oh my god. Yes, I know. <laughs> I just this is this is how I uh, and Northern Exposure follows this in the same way, and that was in the nineties. So I mean, well, this was two thousand, so it was like tail end of the nineties. No, 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 no. It started like in the early 90s. 91 is when the first season started. But this movie is 2000, so tail end of the 90s. Yeah, this movie is. Yeah, but I'm saying Northern Exposure did the same thing with their town. It's very much in this same vein. And both of those, and Schitt's Creek to a later, lesser degree because it was much later, mm-hmm. but both of these show how you can do quirky, multifaceted stories in a small rural town and have it almost have a sense of magical realism about it without it being uh, supernatural. Uh, uh, yeah. And, and quirky and, you know, I mean, uh, and formulaic, it really wasn't mm. formulaic in that Pike who has had, he's the native in the story. And that's the reason why I love this film It's because the native gets the guy in the end. So, um, Pike, plays this plays his character so deftly and so beautifully in his unwilling to open that box of Henry that he had longed for back in high school when all of this is going down. I will say my favorite character aside from Pike, who I mm-hmm. absolutely love, my favorite character in this movie though is Vianne Cox playing his bestie uh, art dealer friend. Mary Margaret. Yeah, Mary Margaret. Oh, my <laughs> God. She absolutely slays me. I, and when she showed up at Mrs. Maisel, I was thrilled. I, like, screamed like a fangirl when she showed up. So I just love that woman. I think she's marvelous. Um, See, she's got her, her, com- her comic timing is so good. It is. But her character was the one disconnect for me. Like, really? I don't, in, this, in this particular story, in the world created in this story... But she you had to was, have it because he ran away to New York and yeah, tried to set and himself. And she was, and she was the New York friend. And when she came to Montana, she was supposed to bring that piece of New York. The problem is, I don't think it fit for me. Really, I, I, my favorite scene is when they're all at the wake and she's eating the food, and he, and he says, "Oh, that's what over there." She goes, a, "A woman did not make this." You know, I, that was my favorite sequence. She mm-hmm. says, oh, I don't care. She goes, you can say whatever you want. A woman did not make this. And she turns around as if it's a throwaway line. And yet it's big. That's the revelatory moment when right. things start revealing themselves to Henry. Um, and it's really kind of a story about stop running, stand, and, and let the world open up to you. And the problem with Henry from the time he was a teenager he was hiding his queerness. He was hiding um, who he had affections for. And and when he tries to put that back together, it only opens a lot of old, old wounds. And Pike, who finally gets to be around Henry again, you know, kind of has that awkward of do I or don't I. And there's a couple of sequences where he's really given the signal, don't. Mm-hmm. Um, what I do love is I do love him using the Onondaga story of the Seven Sisters. That was beautiful. That, that is my one of my favorite parts in the fact that they used uh, my Confederacy's stories, in this, which is just thrilling. I love that. And I love the lake. God damn it. Can I go live there? I, I do want to say, folks, you should watch this for Eric's portrayal of Pike. It is a beautiful example of an actor portraying a character who doesn't let himself have something. Yeah. And... Yeah you feel all of that internal struggle portrayed in the face of this actor. And can I just say the, what I quote, what, my family loves this movie on many levels, you know, the native angles, one of them, but my dad was exactly like, um, Jim in that he, he had a donut brigade of guys mm-hmm. that they would hang around and stuff. And that whole sequence in the end of the Donut Brigade being involved and in trying to get Henry and Pike to mm-hmm. see each other. Um, I just love that. I mean, and in fact, it's, it's just something that has warmed my heart because I lost my dad around that same time. But I know he would have loved this movie. Um, gotcha. He would have really identified with it. So, yeah, this is all this is one of my favorites. This is my rainy day. I just want to make some popcorn or make something to eat, sit down and watch a film that will make me feel good. In the app. 
you know, and this mm-hmm. is that kind of movie. All okay. right. Let's get on to your Ratings. rating. Uh, production quality three. It was produced in 2000 and, you know, some of the technology behind it shows. Uh, script screenplay four. I thought it was perfectly lovely. Nice little story about want and desire and allowing oneself to love. Sound lighting score three. Again, I'm going to cite more the era than anything else. They did a great job with what they had. And it but is that, the is test- that fair to, to a movie to do that? That's the only thing I'll throw out. Is and I'm going to say yes. to judge by modern standards something that was made? In the, it's like you would do that to Hitchcock? Even for the year 2000, I felt it was a little indie. Well, it wasn't indie. <laughs> well, right. And that's why it, it's a three. It's fine. It didn't blow, didn't knock my socks off. Okay. Art direction costuming four. I felt that was perfectly in sync with what it needed to be. Casting five. Uh, every member of this cast played their role to the hilt and then some. Direction direction four. I think the director did a great job with the script and the story. Career themes presented three. I mean, it's a love triangle, and you, you had to deal with the loss of a parent, but there wasn't a whole lot of other stuff going on in terms of queer life. So my personal overall was a four. Um, minor fives across the board, and I'll tell you why. One, I under I get your note about it being the '90s, but I, unlike you, I don't judge a film by today's standards. I just don't. I don't care what fucking situation it is. I just don't. Um, the second thing is that I think the queer themes are vastly more important because you have a native character who is queer, and that is so underrepresented that I think it warrants the five that I'm getting giving it because. It, you just don't see that. You don't see it at all. And to Eric Schweig's credit, when people comment to him that they loved that character, he feels very warm about that. He loves when people remind him of Pipe. So I, I know some of the backstories of this film. And um, it, one of the things I love most is that how much Eric was committed to playing Pipe and how he wanted this performance of his. Because most people know him from uh, The Last of the Mohicans. That's his mm-hmm. biggest film. But um, it, it's kind of like, you know, when you get a role like this as a Native actor, it's so rare and so few and far between. And I think in this case, because of the character's cultural background, it is much more important regardless of where you fall in the spectrum, it is much more important to have that queer representation. It's like, you know, Ms. Marvel for Muslims. You know, it's the same thing. It, it is the fact that they're a lesbian or they're gay or they're bisexual or whatever is almost irrelevant. But just the fact that they're present in the queer community, that's what makes, in my mind, the queer themes being a five. So my overall is a five. Like I said, it's my go-to feel-good movie. I just want to be entertained. I want to go back to that town because I love that town. I love the people in it. I love the way that they all interact with one another. They know each other's stories. They know each other's history. And it has some fabulous lesbians who work at a lumber mill and also do the ambulance driving. So, you know, <laughs> there you go. <laughs> what more do you need? <laughs> Lesbians with power tools and lumber, you know. <laughs> so that's it for this week. I'm going to have to get Vance. I don't know how we're going to do Northern Exposure. That's like nine seasons or something. <laughs> I don't know that kind of time. Uh, maybe we'll do reactions for that sometime. You know, maybe I'll pick certain sequences, certain episodes, because uh, there are several that have this queer thing running through. So we'll do that kind of thing. Uh, but that's another show you can check out. It's very much if you like Schitt's Creek and if you've seen Big Eden or if you haven't and you watch it and you like it, then I would say definitely check out Northern Exposure. It is available. I can't remember what platform it was on, but it is available to watch. Um, I highly recommend you watch that. It has a lot of native elements to it. Oh, by the way, uh, Reservation Dogs just started. So definitely catch that if you haven't watched it. There is a queer native actor in the show um and so definitely check that one out as well all right that's it for this week um moving on to what are we on about so what are you on about uh as i mentioned last week both my parents contracted covid um for those of you who don't know and i know this hasn't been well publicized there is an antibiotic or an antibody infusion 
both have worked. My parents are up and moving around. They're still quarantined in their home, um, but feeling better. Like back to texting full length novels because my mom can be wordy sometimes. So aside from that and the husband being gone, I started watching The Sandman. I am two episodes in. And as Neil did with American Gods, he took his classic work, rethought it for a different media because he knows it's not going to be in print format. This is on a screen. And so there were a couple tweaks made, but they were they were the right tweaks. Um, so as of end of episode two, I am hooked and cannot wait to see more. What about Excellent. you? Is there any queer factor to the Sandman world? I don't know anything of it, so it's... There is when we get to Dee Dee's storyline. Dee Dee is th- uh, his sister who is the personification of death. Right, right. Um, the Dee Dee actually goes to a lesbian bar to listen to an Indigo Girls style singer at one point, which is fantastic. But in terms of the main cast in the printed works, not really. Okay. So we'll see if that's rethought as well. Okay, fair enough. I haven't watched it yet, so I, you know, it's definitely on my watch list because I've been waiting for this. But um, I just didn't know if there was any queer factor to it. Because, you know, Neil Gaiman, you know, is open to doing that kind of stuff. I mean, he did it with American sure. God. So, you know. Yep. Um, and then, so I'm, I'm, my, is that, well, were those all of yours? That's not, my, yeah, that's really all I've had time for this week. Okay. And so, I still have a one the week, though. <laughs> okay. Yeah, we'll get to that. Um, so my, uh, what am I on about? I have two things. Last, last week was my birthday. Um, and again, shout out to my birthday twinsy, Edmund Manning. Edmund, you have to come back to our show. We miss you. We need to catch up. We need to know what Professor Waffles is up to. So that's a call out to me. I'm going to bug you on Facebook Messenger until you sign up. Anyways, the second thing that I'm on about is that I've decided to go back to drawing um and um i'm now going to learn how to do manga uh, and i'm thinking of anime and i'm going to work towards uh putting together uh my mohawks world in kind of a manga and anime mash i kind of want to do something put my own spin on it to make it a little more native uh inflected but that's uh, where I'm going. So it's it's my jump back into creativity. I've been in a dry spell for a bit, but unlike most people, I don't panic about it. I know that things are still working in that little lone gray cell running, screaming around for a thought in my head. Um, so uh, yeah, I'm getting back into the creative mode. And so um, that's what I'm on about. Um, I did watch Uncoupled, which I really loved. And um, I am also looking forward to Sandman. And there was another one that was out. I can't think of what it is. I'll put it up here somewhere um, that uh, I'm definitely on about. Um, and so who are you waiting? Germany. The whole Technically, country of Germany. Yes. Oh, okay. So <clears throat> this actually happened in July, but I only just heard about it this week. Uh ah. The German government revealed plans to make it easier for transgender people to choose their gender and first name. They no longer need to get psychological reports. They no no longer need to go get backing. They can just walk into one of the, um, I forget exactly which office it was, but they can literally just go do that now, or at least it's in the process of being formalized. But the reason that hit my stream is because the uh, London Times author Oliver Moody posted a tweet where the title, the caption literally says German brings gender self ID at age 14 and the nation shrugs proving that for the most part, the general public doesn't care nearly as much as the politicians want us to think they do. So go Germany. Excellent. Excellent. Um, my who won the week this week is the U S Senate for finally putting together the Inflation Reduction Act, we've got something. Um, And it's really starting to get the base on the Democrat side and the independents a little bit more engaged. Um, We now have a chance to keep the Senate in our hands and with the possibility of picking up three more seats. So we'll make mansion and cinema, you know, (laughs) a thing of the past. So cross fingers, eyes, toes, you know, whatever you got, arms, and legs. Uh, you know, let's let's get this to happen. So definitely vote, vote, vote. 
and make sure you register to vote and make sure that you were not taken off the rolls. So you gotta do a little homework before you get your voting pen out, so FYI. Um, and uh, so that's who won the week for me for the Senate to finally have put something together. And, you know, we just need to realize that it's a process. Mm -hmm. And, you know, they finally got something hammered out. It's not everything we want, but it's a first great step. And if we get to the point where we do get those extra senators and we maintain the control of the Senate, we might be able to do many more things. So that's all I got. Nice. All right, folks, written on the edges, produced by Rogue Ravens Media. For our disclaimers, links to social media, our listening stations, or to sign up as a guest, visit www.rogepodcast.com. If you enjoy learning about new artists, please like and subscribe so you get the alerts for new episodes. Go subscribe to our YouTube channel. Make that URL easier for everybody to find, please. And go check out our Shopify. And check out the merchandise. Baz is working on new designs all the time. All the time. I can't keep up. I can't keep up. And now I'll be drawing them. No, I'm only kidding. <laughs> right? <laughs> They will be original. Original. <laughs> They'll be stick figure. <laughs> All right, folks, tune in next week for your Queer Media Fix. Bye-bye. Oh, what's that? Closing time. The bums rush and melody, dear.